Hello, startup listeners. I'm Alex Bloomberg, and I'm not actually hosting today's show. You'll find out who's hosting in a moment. I'm just here with a quick special announcement. Gimlet's newest show, Sampler, where host Brittany Luce brings the world of podcasts to your door in simple, bite-sized, easy-to-consume chunks. That is just weeks away. It is almost there. And right now, at this very moment, there is a promo trailer in the iTunes store. Wherever you get your fine podcasts, go and subscribe. Sampler. One other quick announcement. Reply All, our show about the internet, has a special collaboration this week with a little show called Radiolab. That's right, Radiolab, one of the most popular podcasts in the world. If you're not a listener to Reply All, go ahead and subscribe to that as well. And now, on with the show. Um, who do you think I should start with? Can we start with Jesse? Or should we start with the newest employee? Oh, yeah, start with the newest employee. From Gimlet, you're listening to Startup, the show about what it's really like to start a business. I'm Lisa Chow. This is a special mini-season devoted to our company, Gimlet Media. And I'm hosting the show today because, as we've heard in previous episodes, sometimes when the boss is the one holding the mic, you can't always tell whether the people he's talking to are being totally upfront. Plus, I myself, I had some questions about things that were happening at Gimlet, things I wanted to look into. If you listen to the end of season two, you may remember that I had a baby. So after taking three months off for maternity leave, I came back to a company that looked dramatically different from the one I left. We were still occupying the same space in Brooklyn, but there were a lot more people. Rachel, Jesse, Brittany, Stevie. Who were all these people? My own startup team had transformed. There were two new producers, a new editor. So those first couple of weeks back, I felt a little lost. I mean, I was impressed to see how fast Gimlet had grown. But I was also a little worried, because it seemed like the bigger we were getting, the more confusing things had become. Fia Benin, a producer of Reply All, she couldn't even answer a very simple question. Fia? Hi. How you doing? I'm okay. I have a quick question for you. Okay. Who's your direct boss? Uh... PJ Tim Matt Lieber, <laughs> um, Alex Goldman too. I also didn't mention my other boss, which would be Alex Bloomberg. It's kind of like having parents, but like, like, uh, like on a commune. <laughs> Turns out that this who's your boss line, it stumped almost everyone I asked, even if at first they thought they knew the answer. Hey, Jesse. Hey, how's it going? Okay. Who, who, who's your boss? Caitlin is my boss. Okay. And that, that, and, and that seems very clear to you? Uh, I mean, like, if Alex told me to do something, I'm going to do that, you know. Are you whispering because Alex is about 10 feet away? <laughs> yeah, sort of. Uh, if Alex Bloomberg told me to do something, I, w- I would do it happily. Um, yeah, I mean, if, you know, Chris, Chris Neary, occasionally. If he told me, to, if he asked me to do something, I would, I would, probably, I would probably do that, too. Uh, okay, so the number has grown from one to yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I didn't mention Peter, but Peter... <laughs> 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 Caitlin, who's your direct boss? Uh, just to clarify, this is not Jesse's maybe boss, Caitlin. This is a different Caitlin, Caitlin Roberts, senior producer of Startup. I think, um, I think Alex, although <coughs> recently it's felt like also Peter. So, um, I remember at the beginning of season two, I asked Matt who was my manager, and he said, you were my manager. <laughs> right. Right. And then nobody ever told me that you were my manager. <laughs> so you might be still managing me. <laughs> if I am still your manager, I'm doing a really awful job. In this mini-season, we've heard about big changes at Gimlet. We raised $6 million. We're figuring out the best way to do sponsored content. We're hoping to diversify our staff. But there are things we haven't talked about, things that are perhaps a little less sexy, but have just as much effect. 
maybe an even bigger effect on every single employee here. The question at the center of these things, how do you go from startup to regular company? From a handful of people sitting around a table to managers and policies and org charts. And this conversation can go deep because these things, while they may sound dry, at their core, they're about something pretty important. They're about power. Who has the power to make certain decisions and who doesn't? Today, in this final episode of the Startup Mini Season, we hear from Gimlet's employees about what the very real growing pains of a startup feel like, and we take those pains to the boss. Now, when I left for maternity leave, Caitlin, Caitlin I was supposed to be managing, was a producer on Startup. When I came back three months later, she had been promoted to senior producer, and she was managing a couple of people, Luke Malone and Bruce Wallace, two new producers. This was something she'd never done before. And it was a little awkward. Why do you think it's awkward? Because I think I'm, uh, I'm younger than Luke and Bruce, and that I, I don't have as much journalism experience as either of them. I have more experience on startup and at this company, but uh, it's it's a little bit awkward to be managing two people who you also feel like you have a lot to learn from. I don't want to claim anything that I don't have, which I guess a manager or a boss seems to be this sort of like (laughs) all-knowing, been there, done that. Let me show you the ropes, kid. (laughs) And I don't feel like I can do that. (laughs) And this is pretty common at startups, particularly among early employees. You'll find people in roles they've never been in before, taking on a whole new set of responsibilities. Chris, our chief of staff, had never negotiated a commercial lease before coming to Gimlet. Nazanin had never produced an ad. I had never co-hosted my own show. And when you find yourself in these new positions at a startup, it can often feel like you're working from zero. There are no rules. There is no process. You're making it up as you go. And there's something incredibly liberating about that. But it can also create a lot of pressure. Fill a room with a bunch of people who are in new roles they're not entirely comfortable with, and you're bound to have some conflict. For the Reply All team, that conflict came to a head one evening in early September. I brought PJ Vote and Alex Goldman, the hosts of that show, into the studio to talk about it. Do you remember that night, PJ? Uh, it was the biggest fight we've had as a show. Really? Yeah, 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 definitely. It was a Wednesday, the day Reply All is supposed to post their episodes. The team had edited and mixed the show, and to everyone's surprise, they were done at a relatively decent hour. There was still one section of the story that PJ wasn't entirely comfortable with, but he had lost that argument in the team edit. Alex Goldman and most of the team went home, thinking the show was basically done. PJ and Fia stayed to wrap things up. Then, at around 10 o'clock that night, Alex Bloomberg listened to the episode. And when he ended up listening, he said that part that, like, essentially you are worried about, like, I really think it should come out. I think it is alienating and it makes me, like, dislike this character in your story, it kind of makes me dislike you because you're laughing at it. Like, I think it ruins the story tonally. So fixing that ended up taking us many, many hours because anything you do late at night takes many, many hours. And so tell me, how were you feeling walking home that night? Great. Tired, but great. Like, I think I took a picture of the building as I was leaving. Like, Fia and I, we both are sort of gung-ho about a certain kind of late night. And this was that. It was like taking a thing that we felt pretty good about ironing out the thing we didn't like. There's a couple other changes Alex suggested. Just felt like it made it better. We like stumbled out like gladiators. Okay, so Alex Goldman. Mm Mm-hmm. First, tell me when you heard, like when did you hear about what happened that night? Uh, I listened to the episode the next day. That was the first, that was the way I heard it. It was like a dream where where you go into your house, but it's not quite your house. I was like, oh, I recognize this piece, but it's not quite the piece that I left, you know? Mm -hmm. And my understanding was that it was like all over, but the small details. And there are moments that you have to cut your losses that go beyond just the story. And it's like about sort of the well-being of the people on the on the team and how they perceive what's going on. So, 
I came in that morning afraid that members of our team were going to quit because they saw something that like just the optics of it were, were really, really terrifying. Alex Goldman was mad. The team was mad. They liked some of the moments that Alex Bloomberg thought should be cut from the episode. And they felt that PJ was going over their heads after they had gone home that night to get a second opinion from the big boss. There was a fundamental tension about whose call it was, whose call it should have been. Alex Goldman also saw a cost beyond that week's show. When people work till four in the morning, they're not fresh for the next week's show, putting everyone behind. His fear about people quitting, it's not unfounded. So far, three people have left Gimlet because they weren't happy here. That next morning, the Reply All team came in and had a big fight about that episode. I was really mad. Yeah. I mean, I'm mad talking about it. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bringing this up, Lisa. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. So, but what, I mean, Alex Goldman, were you mad? Were you mad at Alex Bloomberg that night? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I actually sent him an email about it. I sent him an email saying, please never give us notes these late again. It's, it ruins our process. It, it is just like, if you're going to give us notes, they need to be earlier. Similar fights have happened on virtually every team at Gimlet. When there's a disagreement about a story, who makes the final call? On my own startup team, for example, it's actually kind of problematic that Caitlin Roberts and I don't know if I'm her boss or not. Now that she's senior producer, would she have the final say or would I? And it wasn't until these conflicts arose that I found myself wanting something I hadn't thought about before, more structure. It's something I was hearing from a lot of people I talked to. They wanted to know who had the call and who to check in with to see how they were doing. But at the same time, they liked working in a collaborative, non-hierarchical place. It was empowering. Ugh, so confusing. And for Caitlin Kenny, the head of new show development, craving more structure felt, well, uncool. I love structure. Like, I need it. My fear is that my love of structure is going to make me not a cool kid. And maybe I'm just not being, like, startup y enough. Like, maybe I'm not being, like, flexible enough. Like, maybe I'm, like, clinging to sort of, like, a rigidness that I'm used to, you know? So, like, for me, it's like a... I'm sort of struggling personally with, like, okay, where... How much of this do I... Do we actually need? And how much of it do I need to just sort of, like, go with the flow? That tension between wanting structure and wanting freedom... It's probably one of the fundamental tensions in us as people. As a parent, I see it every day in my kids. They want to do things their way, but they also need to know there are limits, that I'm not going to give in every time they scream or whine, that I'm going to protect them from their worst selves. While Caitlin and I were talking, my producer Eric Menel was sitting across the table writing on a piece of paper, maybe doodling, I don't know. Caitlin turned to him and asked if we were just being fuddy-duddies. Are we boring? No, I feel like I totally relate to this fundamental tension where like you came to this place because it was young and new and it was like a playground and all you wanted to do was like see if we could do this better than the places we've been. And we've seen people make so many mistakes and we've like second guessed them and Monday morning quarterbacked them and like we could do it so much better if we could just start from scratch and like like you're a little afraid that all you're doing is building the exact same thing you left in the end. Yes. Yeah. That is like that is such a perfect statement of how I feel. It's totally right. When I think in my head I go to like, oh what should we do to fix this problem? What my mind goes back to is like, oh well, where I came from or other place I've been, they did it this way. But then yeah, then in my mind I'm like, yeah, and you hated it. One thing was clear. People had a lot of ambivalence about the stuff that was happening at Gimlet. There was discomfort. There was conflict. And so, I decided to tell my bosses about it. On tape. Um. Okay. How are you feeling? Terrified. I feel like you've been out gathering just information about questions that you can ask to make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, that hasn't been our only objective. <laughs> right after these words from our sponsors. Hey. 
This episode of Startup is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com provides over 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers. Audible.com is offering our listeners a free 30-day trial membership. And I'm a parent. I read to my kids. And one question I always have, the voices. Like, take the cat in the hat, for example. How is the cat in the hat supposed to sound? Or Sally, or her brother? Or the fish? What's the voice supposed to be for a talking fish? Audible has solved this problem by hiring professionals. Their Cat in the Hat is read by John Cleese, John Lithgow, Billy Crystal, Dustin Hoffman, Kelsey Grammer. But I like to be here. Oh, I like it a lot, said the Cat in the Hat to the fish in the pot. I will not go away. I do not wish to go. And so, said the Cat in the Hat. So, 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 I will show you another good game that I know. Frasier from Cheers might be better at reading to my children than I am. Go to audible.com slash startup to start your free trial today. Show your support for startup and get a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash startup. This episode of Startup is brought to you by NatureBox. NatureBox is a snack company on a mission to make smart, delicious snacking easy. Recently, we talked with NatureBox CEO Gotham Gupta about the very early days of the company, before they had more than 100 snacks to choose from and thousands of subscribers. Back then, Gotham was prototyping the very idea of this company, boxes of snacks that people ordered online. But he had no idea how to actually get his hands on the bulk ingredients he needed to make the snacks to put in those early nature boxes. So he went undercover, at least in his own mind. We developed this relationship with a guy at Whole Foods and we were you know, buying some products from him, um, bulk products. And you know, I initially thought we were doing something illegal. Maybe he's not allowed to sell us these cases of uh, granola or trail mix or whatever it is. And soon enough, we realized that it was totally legit and there was no reason that I needed to you know, hide and, and and pay the guy cash and all this, so. (laughs) Why did you think it was illegal to buy snacks? You just thought that the guy was like, sort of like skimming off the top. Oh yeah, oh totally. This is what it takes to get the company running in the beginning. All cash under the table payments to our stores at Whole Foods. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Looking back on it, we've learned a lot. NatureBox, founded by a guy who didn't, but would, buy black market granola if he thought it was the best ingredient he could find. Visit naturebox.com slash startup to get 50% off your first box now. Naturebox, smart, delicious snacking made easy. Welcome back to Startup. I'm Lisa Chow. In reporting on my own company, another thing I learned, the tensions I was seeing in the staff about day-to-day life here at Gimlet, I also noticed in Matt and Alex. It became especially clear to me after I tried a little experiment. I asked them each to rate a bunch of things here at Gimlet on a scale of one to three. One being below expectations and three being above. That was one of the first things I did when I sat down to talk to Alex. How would you rate the following during Gimlet's first year? Okay. Okay. Yes. Quality of shows. Three. Listener numbers. Three. Team dynamics on individual shows. Two. I wasn't as concerned with why Alex or Matt were giving the numbers they were giving. I was more interested to see whether there were any differences in their ratings. Alex didn't give anything below a two. But when I sat down with Matt, he did. Quality of the shows. Two. Listener numbers. Three. Team dynamics, meaning within the individual shows. Team dynamics. One. Planning for the future. One. It's really hard for me to not hear numbers like that and take them personally. Here's Alex. I told him about Matt's answers when we were in the studio together. It's really hard. And like, and I feel like it's like shockingly hard. Like I wouldn't have thought that it would be hard, but you do because there's like, because embedded in those numbers are sort of like, it feels like, well, I should be doing, I should be doing something that I'm not doing. I should be doing something different. I should be making it so that that isn't the case that it's, I'm, I'm the CEO of the company. I need to figure out a way to like make, make it feel like the dynamics are better, you know? Um, And I don't, and I don't know what to do about that. You know what I mean? I don't know what to do. I'm trying everything I can. This is something I hadn't thought about much before this interview. Just like the rest of us who are new at our jobs here with responsibilities we've never had before, Alex is new at his job too. 
He's never been a founder, a CEO, with dozens of people whose livelihoods depend on him. He's been a manager before, sure. But this is at a whole nother level. The weirdest part of it is that I do feel like I'm in a bubble now. Like, just you coming and talking to me about some of this stuff right now, like, I don't... It's so frightening. I will go and have the same fucking lunch with the same fucking person. And I will come away thinking something totally different than what... And then I'll hear from you. And you'll be saying, like, they're, I'm worried they're going to quit. And I didn't get any of that. If there was, like, a day apart, you know, that we're having lunch. And that is just, like, frightening. I don't know what to... Do. I, I hate I hate that. I don't know what to do about that. And it's something that's come up a little bit on Startup and sort of as a joke. But it's really... It's really a bummer. I just really don't want that. Uh, so I don't know. Like, that's really frustrating. I don't know what to do about that. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or if I'm, like, somehow creating the expectation that I only want to hear good things or if people are afraid to tell me bad things or if I'm just hearing it, I'm hearing it in a warped way that I'm, like, not acknowledging fully what they're saying. I don't I don't know. What do you think? I, I, I've thought a lot about this. Um because, I mean, I've thought a lot about this because I myself have censored myself around you. Yeah. Why do you censor yourself? I, I mean, I think it's in part because, I mean, I do think that it's because you are, you're an optimist. When you come to an edit and the draft is awful, I would never, like from your body language, from your voice, ever think... Like, wow, Alex thinks this is awful. You know, uh-huh. what What I hear from you typically is excitement and a vision on how to get the draft to, like, a better place, mm-hmm. right? So I think that, like, when you're dealing with someone like that, you don't want to be the Debbie Downer. <laughs> I played this tape for my husband, and he thought I was sucking up to the boss. But I wasn't saying anything I didn't believe. Still, listening back to that moment, I did realize there was something I was thinking that I wasn't saying out loud, which is Alex's optimism isn't always a good thing. Matt echoed that when I sat down with him. In a lot of ways, the company is an expression of his personality. It's open, it's positive. Alex is incredibly positive. He's not Pollyanna-ish. He's not like, oh, everything's going to be fine. He's, but he's like, we're going to make it work. Do you see a downside to his optimism? Yeah. He always believes that people will change even if they won't. So I believe I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm very positive, but I don't have as much faith in people's ability to change. And I'm, I'm much more aggressive in making, in um, being comfortable saying, like, if someone isn't going to change, then we need to change for them. Change for them. That's business speak for firing. That's not something we've done here at Gimlet, because frankly, we haven't had to. There are lots of other ways to deal with conflict. There's mediation, moving people into different roles, things like that. And yet firing people, while it's ugly and complicated, it happens at every company. When we were raising the Series A investment, I had a conversation with a VC who was asking me how it was going and it's like what are you how are things going what are you what are you thinking about what are you concerned about and I said a thing that we're thinking about a lot is culture and making sure that we are really intentional about creating a great culture and being explicit about communicating it to the team right and he's like it's like how big's the team now you know, we're 25 people. He's like, okay, cool. He's like, and like, what's the turnover been? I'm like, turnover? He's like, yeah, how many people have you fired in the last year? I said, we haven't. So we've had three people leave. Uh, we haven't fired anyone. He's like, he's like, I don't want to say anything about your team because maybe you have 25 superstars. But every successful company I've seen has had actually quite a bit of churn in their first year as they seek to get the right leadership in place. 
And it would be highly, highly unlikely if every single one of the people at your company like is meeting the bar. It was really uncomfortable, first of all. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that, that's like terrifying part, me right yeah, now. Yeah, part of me was like, I mean, I kind of came up with some rationalization. I was sort of defensive. And then to, for the next two weeks, that's like all I thought about. He's like, I'm not saying you have to be a ruthless monster, but like you have to confront that fact. You have to confront the fact that you are going to have to do that. And actually culture is a function of who you hire, how the leaders of the organization behave, and who you fire. Am I getting fired? I don't, I, so <laughs> I do not joke about that. Right. As an employee at Gimlet, this conversation sent chills down my back. I asked some coworkers if Matt's story scared them too. And they said, strangely enough, it didn't. It gave them some relief knowing that their bosses would have the gumption to do the hard thing if the circumstances ever called for it. And a lot of us have worked in places where people rarely got fired, and we were intimately familiar with the downsides of that. But in talking more with Matt and Alex, they were clear. While they would be willing to fire someone at some point, they didn't think there was anyone who should be fired now. They don't want this to be the type of place where you churn through employees at the first sign of trouble. Because conflict is inherent to the creative process. People have different tastes, different ideas about what's good, and different ideas about how to get to good. There's no way to have this go smoothly, I don't think. There's chaos and there's sort of like tension on certain teams and there's tension brewing on other teams that like a week ago I would have been like, oh, they're they're fine. So I was just, you know, in a in a meeting with two two employees who were sort of like talking a lot about like their roles and how they what they wanted and 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 their issues with each other and sort of like you know it was pretty raw and pretty honest and people left the meeting like angry and upset. Uh, I thought somebody might cry. So it doesn't look good at that particular moment. Yeah. I think um, that it will be resolved somehow in, you know, with time and with more conversations like that. And I was proud that everybody was doing it. Everybody was like in the room having the conversation and like not leaving and slamming the doors and like, saying when they were mad and having their voices raised, but also just continuing to talk. Um, And I think we haven't always done that. Like, I I think there's been some, like some sources of tension have just never been fully, that that has not happened. And I think that's where it's the most toxic. I feel like if, if we can get to a place where like, when you have issues, when we have issues with each other, that we can actually voice them. And it's hard as I can say, sitting here on this microphone, having people voice their issues to me, it's really hard to just like listen and try to not be defensive and try to not like say, but, 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 you know, it's really right, hard. Right, right, right. At one point during my interview with Alex, he asked me whether I thought he was right for the CEO job. A tough question for me to answer, honestly, because I do work for him. But the truth is, Alex knows how to inspire people. He wants to help people grow, and his optimism has gotten us to where we are now. These are all qualities I want my CEO to have. I also want my CEO to engage with conflict when necessary, and to know when to draw the line and tell me, Lisa, you've got to meet this deadline, or no, Lisa, you can't have it your way. Someone who protects me from my worst self. When I first came back from maternity leave, I was shocked looking at all the new people in the office. Recently, I had another experience like that. It was at the Gimlet holiday party. We all met at a restaurant in town, family members came, there was a three course meal, and people gave toasts. And again, I looked around and was surprised by the sheer number of people in the room. And on the cab ride home, I realized how crazy it is to expect one person to deal with each of those people's problems and conflicts. Alex hired most of us, yes, but the company is bigger than him now. 
In theory, I'm excited about the fact that Gimlet is growing. I'm glad that I have new responsibilities. I'm pretty sure I would not be able to do the things I'm doing at Gimlet anywhere else. And I love the people I work with. But I want to make sure that in our second year as a company, we start understanding who has the call. And we hire the right people to help make those calls. Despite all of our successes, there are still ways in which we don't have our shit together. And maybe that will inspire us to build more structure. But not too much. So that wraps up our special mini season about Gimlet Media. Alex, you want to read the credits with me? <laughs> <laughs> Here I am in the studio. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do want to read the credits. And also, we have a, a special announcement coming up here, so stick around. This episode was produced by Lisa Chow and Eric Menel, editing from Peter Clowney and Caitlin Kenny. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Our special ad music comes from the band Build Buildings. More music this week from hotmoms.gov. Special thanks this week to Tom Lehman, Alan Zakori, and the folks at Genius, and to Chris Fussell. And another special thanks to all the superstars here at Gimlet. This show literally could not exist without you guys. Our website, where you can listen to all the past episodes of Startup, is GimletMedia.com. While you're there, you can also check out all of Gimlet's other shows, Reply All, Surprisingly Awesome Mystery Show, and our brand new show, Sampler. Thanks to our sponsor, NatureBox. NatureBox has more than 100 snacks to choose from, like their sriracha roasted cashews or their sourdough cheddar pretzels. Visit NatureBox.com slash startup to get 50% off your first box now. NatureBox, smart, delicious snacking made easy. Thanks to our sponsor, Audible.com. Audible.com provides over 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. Go to audible.com slash startup to get a free 30-day trial today. That's audible.com slash startup. And here's the special announcement. We have a full season three of Startup coming out this spring and we need your help with one of the episodes. We have done a lot of stories here on Startup about what it takes to start a company. Now we want to explore something else that many entrepreneurs deal with but rarely discuss, what happens when it ends. How do you start over? What do you learn from your mistakes? And we're looking for your stories. Maybe you're at a struggling startup with only a few weeks to live. Maybe you're planning a boardroom coup right now. Maybe you're about to sell or be acquired. We want to hear it not just from founders, but employees. So if you know of a startup or you're at a startup going through something like this right now, let us know. Send your stories to nextstartup at gimletmedia.com. That's nextstartup, all one word, at gimletmedia.com. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the spring.